This continues the lecture on centripetal force. We're going to specifically take a look at two examples in this video. As we do, we're going to further explore the fictitious forces that arise in rotating reference frames. Okay, let's go ahead and immediately take a look at the first of the two examples. It has to do with the rotating Earth. So what is the effective or apparent value of G at the Earth's equator as the Earth rotates? As I indicated in my previous lecture on centripetal force, from the surface of the Earth, from the non-inertial reference frame, we would then, for example, feel a fictitious force. To keep the geometry simple in terms of the calculation, we're going to understand the effects of that fictitious force if we take a look at this situation involving what happens at the Earth's equator. I'm also going to reference one of the earlier kinematics examples that I did at the beginning of this description of centripetal force. I did that problem earlier in a previous lecture. At any rate, however, here is our situation. Okay, so right here we'll say is the Earth, let's say that we're looking down on the pole of the Earth, like so, and then therefore the circle that I drew here is the equator. Okay, and then just to kind of picture things, let's say that we have a person standing here at the equator like so, and then right here is a bathroom scale that the person is standing upon. Okay, I'll, we'll understand why I'm drawing off a situation like that as we proceed. Okay, now as the Earth rotates, there's a centripetal acceleration like so, inwards towards the center of the circle, towards the axis of rotation. As long as you're standing at the equator, the radius of that circle is equal to the radius of the Earth. Okay, the radius of the Earth is a given. It's 6,400 kilometers, 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. And even though it doesn't specifically say so in the problem, the period of the Earth's rotation, of course, is one day. Okay, one day is equal to 86,400 seconds. Okay, now when you stand on a bathroom scale, say, at the Earth's equator, there are just two forces acting on you. There is, for example, the normal force like so, and then the force of gravity straight downwards towards the center of the Earth. That's also the direction, however, of the centripetal acceleration vector, as long as you're standing at the equator. If you're off the equator at a different line of latitude, then the geometry is a little bit more complicated. Okay, now these two forces do not cancel each other out. <coughs> From the inertial point of view, in other words, if we were standing off of the Earth and just watching what happens as this rotation occurs, we would then have mg in the same direction as a, and then minus the normal force in the opposite direction, this then equals the net force mass times acceleration like so. So mg and n do not cancel each other out for this reason. Okay, now what is it that we're trying to solve for here? Well, this is an apparent weight problem in disguise. Think of the apparent weight that is the normal force. This is, of course, what the bathroom scale, for example, would read if the person was standing on it like so. Think of the normal force, the apparent weight, as being equal to the following. It's equal to the mass of the person multiplied by what we're trying to find, the effective or apparent value of g. In other words, if you were standing at the Earth's equator and you did a free fall experiment, essentially what we're asked to find here is what you would measure. As we're going to find, it's a little bit less than 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, now the right-hand side of the equation, of course, is the same thing that it was before, like so. And then notice that the mass cancels out, like so. So then therefore everybody is going to feel the exact same value of g at the surface of the Earth, and now let's go ahead and find that effective value. In order to find that effective value, we have to take these two terms here and algebraically switch them. This then gives me the following. As the effective value of g. So the effective value of g is less than the actual value by this amount. This amount here, the centripetal acceleration, is what we calculated in an earlier kinematics example at the beginning of this unit on centripetal force. From that earlier example, let me write that here. From an earlier example, the centripetal acceleration, v squared over the radius of the Earth, this was a small value. It was 0 0.034 meters per second squared. And at the time, I noted how small that is compared to 9.8 meters per second squared. So then therefore, if we plug that value into here and then subtract it from G, so 9.8 minus 0 0.034, the effective value of G that you feel if you stand at the Earth's equator is 9.766 meters per second squared. 
The difference, however, between this value and 9.8 meters per second squared, this value here is so small that you're never gonna feel it with your senses, but it is detectable. It's detectable, for example, by using, say, Foucault's pendulum. Essentially what Foucault's pendulum is designed to do is it's designed to detect the effective value of G. It's finding, if you will, or physically detecting the fictitious force that's exerted upon it as the pendulum rotates at the surface of the rotating Earth. Excuse me, as the pendulum oscillates at the surface of the rotating Earth. So basically, Foucault's pendulum is designed to detect this. This then ultimately resulted in the first physical detection of the Earth's rotation in the 19th century. Okay, let's immediately move on from there to the next example. Okay, I had to position the next example on my screen. Let me also go ahead and do some erasing here. Okay, and then we have the following. It says that a torus-shaped space station has a diameter of 100 meters. What is the period of rotation such that occupants inside have an apparent weight equal to their actual weight on Earth? Okay, now the word torus. The word torus refers to a specific type of geometry. You actually can eat a couple of examples of toruses as breakfast food. I'm talking about such things as donuts, bagels, and so on and so forth. Here's a nice example of a torus. What you do is you take a cylinder and you then attach the ends of the cylinder like so, such that you end up with a donut. And then this donut here is referred to as a torus. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take this torus and then rotate it. We're not going to rotate it like this. Instead, what we'll do is we'll rotate it about an axis that passes through the geometrical center perpendicular to the plane of the circle itself. So then therefore it rotates like this. So then imagine being a passenger or an occupant inside of this structure. From your non-inertial reference frame, from your non-inertial situation, you would then feel a fictitious force away from the axis of rotation. You would feel the centrifugal force. So then therefore your feet would end up on the inside surface of the outer wall. The situation then therefore would look something like this. Okay, so here's this torus-shaped space station, like so. Where right here is the axis of rotation, and then therefore the person's feet would be on the inside surface of the outer wall like so. So from their non-inertial point of view, they would feel a fictitious force away from the center of the circle, therefore their feet would be like this. However, be that as it may, we're still always gonna set up and solve the situation from the inertial point of view as we always do. So imagine being outside of the space station and just watching this thing rotate around. What forces do we see acting on the person? We only see one force, and that's the normal force, like so. And it's the normal force that's inwards towards the center of the circle, like so, thereby giving us the centripetal acceleration vector. Don't be confused here. There's no force of gravity being exerted on the person. So if you want to think of this most easily, think of this space station or this structure as like way out in space somewhere, away from planets and so on and so forth, so there's no force of gravity being exerted on the person. You can also visualize this, for example, as the entire space station being in free fall as it orbits the Earth. Therefore, from the inertial reference frame, the only force that's important here is the normal force like so, as we've already indicated. Okay, now let's just go ahead and add up everything by using F equals NA. We then therefore only have one force, and that gives us the net force, mass times acceleration. Before I go through the remainder of the example, by the way, you may have seen a structure such as this in a very famous science fiction movie that was originally released in 1969, and that's the science fiction film 2001 A Space Odyssey. In that film, in 2001 A Space Odyssey, very prominently in a number of scenes early in the film, there is a torus-shaped space station such as this that is being depicted. This idea as an engineering design has been around for quite a while. However, we have, as of yet, have never built one of these structures for various technical difficulties I'll get to in just a few minutes. But let's go through the remainder of the example. Okay, now, with this expression, we are given, first of all, only one value and that's the total diameter of the space station like so is 100 meters, therefore the radius of curvature like so, that's given to us as 50 meters. The radius of the circle, that is, is 50 meters. 
And then we're not going to find the speed v of the person. Instead, what we're going to do is find the period of a rotation. Therefore, in just a few moments, I'm going to make the following substitution for the speed v. But before I do, what do I do about the normal force? Once again, like the last example, think of this as an apparent weight problem. We want the person to feel as if they're standing on the surface of the earth. So therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the apparent weight equal to their actual weight on the earth. Once again, there's no force of gravity being exerted upon the person, but we want the person to feel as if they're standing on the earth. Therefore, on the left-hand side of the expression, I'm going to set the normal force equal to the person's weight on the surface of the earth like so. And then, like in the last example with the rotating earth, notice that the mass of the person cancels out. So everybody inside the structure right here feels the exact same thing. They feel as if they're standing on the surface of the earth. Okay, now let's go ahead and substitute in for the speed v. Once again, we'll make this substitution here. Square each of the terms and then cancel out a radius like so. Like this, and then at this point, let's just go ahead and solve for the period. All right, so cross multiply in order to do so first. Like so, and then just take the square root of both sides. Like so, and now let's go ahead and plug in. And as we'll see, the period here is rather short. So 2 times pi, and then multiply it here by the square root of and then r divided by g. So 50, and then divided by 9.8. And this comes out to be about 14.2 seconds, so almost 15 seconds. So we have to rotate this thing, thing basically four times per minute, once every 15 seconds or so, in order for inhabitants inside the space station to feel as if they're standing on the Earth. Now, as I mentioned earlier, ultimately this idea as an engineering design has been around since the late 1950s. But as of yet, we've never built one of these things. And the reason for that is because of the te technical difficulties that are involved. First of all, the structure itself is huge. This diameter that we're given here in this example is 100 meters. Just to give you an idea as to big, how big exactly 100, meter to, 100 meters is, for example, just go out the back door of my classroom and then go all the way down the hallway to the faculty parking lot. That distance is about 100 meters. So imagine a donut with that diameter. There is no way that we can build a structure like that here at the surface of the Earth and then launch it up in a orbit. It's just way too big. So then, therefore, if we were going to do something like that, we would then have to assemble it in orbit. That would then require an enormous initial expenditure to do so. In addition to that, you want to make the structure as big as possible. And the reason for that is because if you unevenly distribute the mass inside of the torus, then as it rotates, it will wobble. And believe me, that's the last thing that you want when you ultimately build a structure such as this. So you have to make it large in order for it to be stable. And then once you have assembled it in orbit, you then have to spin it up to uniform circular motion. There are technical difficulties, of course, and involved in doing something like that. However, there are a number of private companies out there right now, for example, SpaceX, that have designed structures such as this, and perhaps then ultimately construct a prototype maybe sometime within the next decade or so. And then what you can do as a private industry uh, or a private company is you can ultimately then like turn it into a hotel or a casino or an amusement park or something like that. There are a couple of interesting possibilities associated with such a structure, and this is what motivates, for example, entrepreneurs to explore the idea. For example, hey, let me do some racing here. Okay, just take a look at this expression here once again, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna solve it for g, but think of this as an effective value of g, just like in the last example with the rotating earth. So let me cross multiply and write the expression like so. Okay, notice that the closer you get to the axis of rotation, in other words, if you make r smaller and smaller, then the effective value of g that you feel begins to decrease as well. So imagine building a structure such as this, and you build it with multiple floors, say, like in a hotel or something. And then people could, for example, pay to stay in this hotel such that they feel as if they're standing on the surface of the earth. But then you could also perhaps charge a little bit extra for anybody who wants to stay on the floor that is here, say, closer to the axis of rotation. So then, therefore, the value of g that they would feel would be less say, as if they were standing at the surface of Mars. 
and then closer still is if you were standing on the surface of the moon, and then right at the axis of rotation itself, therefore your effective value of G would be zero, and then therefore you would be in free fall. So you could put like a free fall gymnasium or something like that right there at the axis of rotation for the guests to enjoy. There are a couple of other interesting things about this concept. Let me now use this concept of exploring another fictitious force that occurs in rotating reference frames. Let me describe it to you in the following way. Okay, I'm gonna do some racing here. Once again, for reference, here's the axis. Okay, here's our little person. So, okay, we don't need the math for this, so let me get rid of that. Okay, then let's say that we build one of these things like so. Let's say it is, in fact, a hotel or something like that, and you happen to stay right here, such as if you feel as if you're just standing on the surface of the earth. And then you go into a gymnasium, and it's a basketball court, and somebody hands you a basketball, and they say, okay, go play basketball. Even though you feel as if you're standing on the earth, is the game of basketball going to behave as if you were at the surface of the earth? No, it will not. You'll begin to see another fictitious force that arises in the rotating reference frames. Here's how it works. Okay, let's say that this structure here is rotating counterclockwise. So at this moment, this then means that the person is moving in this direction, like so. And then let's say that the person takes this marker and they do something like this, like so. Okay, after the person lets go of the marker, think of this question very carefully, from the inertial reference frame. In other words, if we were outside of the station watching this guy rotating around, after the person lets go of the marker, is there a force exerted on the marker? No. So then therefore, it's going to obey the law of inertia. It's going to move in a straight line at a constant speed. I'm drawing, by the way, this vector diagram as I'm doing here for a reason. Because after the person lets go of the marker, these two vector components add together to give us a velocity vector of the marker that looks like this. So once again, after the person lets go of the marker, there's no force exerted on it from the inertial reference frame. So it's going to move at a constant speed in a straight line like so. Now, if the person tosses it just right, in the time necessary for the marker to go from here to here, he will rotate from here to here and then catch the marker. However, if the person throws the marker too hard, well then in the time that it takes the marker to go from here to here, he may actually only rotate from here to here. And he will then see the marker land on the floor in front of him. He will see a fictitious force that appears to push the marker to the side in front of him. This fictitious force that occurs in rotating reference frames and that occurs to the side is called the Coriolis force. It's named after somebody. The Coriolis force is a fictitious sideways force. It's lateral, but I'll just say sideways. A fictitious sideways force that occurs in rotating reference frames. So then therefore, if the person threw the marker too hard, they would see it could push in front of them. That would be to the side in this description. This then is an example of the Coriolis force. If the person tossed it too softly, in the time that it takes the marker to go from here to here, he may then actually rotate from here to here. And he would then see the marker land on the floor behind him. He would then once again see the fictitious Coriolis force. So if you play basketball on such a structure, well, it's going to be an entirely different game of basketball than it would be here at the surface of the Earth, even though it feels as if you're standing on the surface of the Earth. Depending upon how big the structure is, depending upon how you actually throw the basketball, you'll be able to then see the Coriolis force occur. In today's folder, I am assigning to you the following film. It's called Frames of Reference. In that film, that film does a wonderful job of depicting the Coriolis force. I will be referencing that a little bit later on in my lectures as well. But make sure that you watch that film posted in today's folder. Okay, now here's another example of the Coriolis force. Does the Coriolis force occur here at the surface of the Earth? Yes, it does, because the surface of the Earth is a rotating reference frame. Here's how it works. It's a little tricky. Okay, let me grab a globe. 
Okay, like so. I'm gonna go ahead and take North America here and then face it towards the phone. Okay, and then recall that the Earth rotates from west to east, so the Earth is doing this, like so. And then let's say we're here in the north, and what we're going to do is we're going to throw a projectile. We're not going to throw it over a distance of a few feet, however, like in this classroom. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to throw it over a large distance of hundreds or thousands of miles from the north to the south. Okay, now, relative to the Earth's axis of rotation, which section of the Earth, here in the north, or here further to the south is moving faster in this direction as the Earth rotates. This point is. Relative to the axis of rotation, this point right here is moving faster in that direction than this point is right here. So then therefore, if you threw a projectile from the north towards the south, from the inertial reference frame, in other words, if you're off the Earth and just watching the projectile, you would see a perfect parabola. However, from the surface of the Earth, if you launched from the north to the south, you would ultimately then see the projectile appear to get pushed to the west. You would see a fictitious force, that sideways force, the Coriolis force, pushing the projectile to the west like so. It works backwards if you throw it from the south to the north. Here in the south, you're moving faster in this direction relative to the axis of rotation than this point is. So then therefore, if you threw it from the south to the north, relative to the surface of the earth, the non-inertial reference frame, you would then see the projectile get pushed to the east. It is this Coriolis force, this sideways force that occurs over large distances on the surface of the earth that causes, for example, storm systems to rotate the way they do. In the northern hemisphere, all storm systems rotate counterclockwise for this reason. So watch, for example, news footage, say, of a rotating hurricane. You're going to see it rotating counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. Even, for example, when a storm system passes through Southern California, you will see the rotation of the storm system like so, counterclockwise, even though the storm system is moving from the west to the east as it moves through the area. It's backwards in the southern hemisphere for the exact same reasons. The Coriolis force in the southern hemisphere, ultimately storm systems rotate clockwise due to the Coriolis force in that hemisphere. Does this mean that when you flush a toilet in the northern hemisphere and then flush a toilet in the southern hemisphere, the toilet water rotates backwards? No. The Coriolis force is only noticeable over really large distances because the Earth's rotation is rather slight. If you could see the Coriolis force over a distance of a foot, well, ultimately this would then mean that the Earth is rotating so quickly, you would actually have trouble standing in the bathroom. So you're only going to be able to see the Coriolis force, this rotation, say, counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, over large distances, tens of hundreds of miles, that sort of thing. But it is noticeable. It does have to be corrected for, for example, when launching a projectile over large distances over the surface of the Earth, it has to be corrected for when navigating, for example, in aviation from one airport to the other. But the Coriolis force, to summarize, is once again a fictitious sideways force that occurs in rotating reference frames. Okay, let me conclude this video here.